Welcome to lesson 2c, equation of fluid statics. In this lesson we'll derive the equation of fluid statics and then discuss a simplified case for incompressible fluid. Here's the derivation. We consider an infinitesimal fluid element with these dimensions as we sketch here. We'll always define gravity as down. We can think of this element in terms of a free body diagram just like an EMEC class. Since we're talking about hydrostatics, there's no acceleration. The fluid is at rest and therefore sigma f equals zero. In hydrostatics, there can be no viscous or shear forces because, as we've said previously, a fluid at rest cannot resist a shear stress. So only normal forces can act on this body. We split sigma f into body forces and surface forces. We'll develop expressions for both of these and then set this equation equal to zero. Let's consider body forces first. Let's take this as the center of the element. The only body force we have here is gravity. The vector gravity force is mg or rho gv or since the volume is dx dy dz, rho dx dy dz g. A side comment here about my notation. V with a line through it means volume, and V without a line through it means speed or the magnitude of velocity. In the textbook we use a different font to distinguish these two capital V's. Since G acts in the negative Z direction, we can write G as negative G times K, where K is the unit vector in the Z direction. So the sum of all the body forces is negative rho G dx dy dz times K. So we have the first one of these completed. Now let's look at surface forces. As I mentioned, the only surface force we have are normal, in particular only pressure forces. Let's let the pressure be P0 at the center of the body. When I say body, that means this little fluid element. This is hard to draw in 3D, but let's look at the center of each of these faces. Here's the center of the front face, the right face, and the top face. I'll use dashed lines for the left face since it's hidden, the back face, and the bottom face. For the pressure forces, let's consider the average pressure on each of the six faces. Since this element goes to zero, we're really talking about pressure at a point, but we need to have a finite fluid element in order to have some change across the faces. Let's consider the pressure acting on the front face and on the back face. Again, I use dashed lines when this is hidden. Recall from a previous lesson that pressure acts inward and normal at any surface. In general, pressure is a function of x, y, z, and t in the Cartesian coordinate system. In other words, pressure is a function of space and time. Thus, we have to use partial derivatives, the Greek symbol del not total derivatives, the more common D. In many places in this lecture, we're going to use truncated Taylor series expansions. Consider a point ds away from the center of our fluid element. ds can be in any direction. So if we're considering the point here, we use a Taylor series expansion as follows. P at this new location is equal to the pressure at the center plus del P del s ds plus you remember Taylor series expansions, 1 over 2 factorial, del squared p del s squared times ds squared plus higher order term. Since ds goes to 0, this term is much smaller than this term, so we'll ignore higher order terms. This is now a truncated Taylor series expansion. Now let's go back to our fluid element. I'll erase this to get rid of some clutter. Let's take the x direction, the front and back faces, and think about what is the pressure at this point in the center of the front face. The pressure at the front face will be P0 plus del P del X, since we're in the X direction, times the distance from the center to that face. Well, since this is dx, that distance is half of dx, so it's dx over 2, plus those higher order terms that we're ignoring. Similarly, on the back face, the pressure is P0 plus del P del X times negative dx over 2 since we're going in the negative x direction. Let's sum up the two forces in this x direction. By the way, those are the only two forces acting on the front and back surfaces since there's no shear stresses or shear forces. Now let's add those up. We'll sum up all the surface forces in the x direction. I'll call this sigma f surface comma x. Careful with our signs. On the front face, the pressure is acting in the negative x direction. So we have to put in a negative sign. While on the back face, the pressure is acting in the positive x direction. So we write it this way. For the front face, negative P0 plus del P del x dx over 2. That's the pressure. The area of that face is dy dz. And force is pressure times area. So this is the force on the front face. For the back face, we have no negative sign. But we did have a negative sign here. The area is also dy dz. That's the area of the back face. So pressure times area, again, is force. 
So this is the force on the back face. Well, these two terms cancel, and these two terms add up, and thus we have negative sigma f surface in the x direction is negative del p del x dx dy dz. Going back to our drawing, we now do the same thing for forces due to pressure in the y direction and in the z directions, keeping in mind that pressure always acts inward and normal. I'm not going to write all this out, but we do the same kind of truncated Taylor series analysis as we did in the x direction. I'll just do one of these. On the right face, the distance is dy over 2, and the partial derivative is del p del y. So this is the force acting on the right face. You can see that the math turns out to be the same, except for changing x to y and then to z. So let's go back here and say similarly for the y and z directions, sigma f surface y is minus del p del y dx dy dz, and sigma f surface z is negative del p del z dx dy dz. These are three components of the surface force, which is a vector. We have the x, y, and z directions. So now our hydrostatic equation needs to be generated by doing a vector summation of all the forces and setting it equal to zero. From above, we split it into body and surface forces. Again, this is a vector equation, but let's consider the x direction, or the unit vector i component. In the x direction, there's no body force, so that term is zero. And in the x direction, the surface force was given up here, negative del p del x dx dy dz. The sum of these has to equal zero, and we simplify this to del p del x equals zero. This is very significant. It tells us that pressure does not vary in the x direction in hydrostatics. We're assuming, of course, that gravity acts in the minus z direction. Similarly, in the y direction, zero minus del p del y dx dy dz must equal zero, so del p del y equals zero. We conclude that p does not vary in the y direction either in hydrostatics. Now let's consider the z direction. Now we have both a body force and a surface force in the z direction. We already solved for the body force and the surface force. So in the z direction, we write the body force and the surface force, and they must sum to zero. The volume of the fluid element, dx dy dz, cancels in both terms. Therefore, del p del z is equal to negative rho g. I'll call that equation one. Unlike the x and y directions, pressure does vary in the z direction in hydrostatics. The bottom line from this derivation can be stated as follows. In fluid statics, in a continuous fluid, in other words, no gap, or not, we're not talking about two different fluids here, one continuous fluid, P does not vary horizontally, but V does vary vertically. This is an extremely important concept in hydrostatics. Furthermore, because of this negative sign, P decreases as you go up, or P increases as you go down. That one's easier to remember. For example, when you go swimming, you get more pressure on your ears as you go down. And this agrees with our previous equation for hydrostatics, which was P below equal P above plus rho g delta z, which you should recall from a previous lesson. This agrees with our derivation now. So kind of a summary in hydrostatics. By the way, hydrostatics typically refers to liquids whereas the more general fluid statics refers to liquids or gases. So for fluid statics, remember P is normally a function of X, Y, Z, and T. But if this is fluid at rest, nothing's changing with time. We just showed that P is not a function of X or Y. So P is a function of Z only in fluid statics. So our equation one, which was del P del Z is minus rho G, can be simplified since we can use D, total derivative, instead of del, partial derivative. You need partial derivatives when a variable is a function of more than one independent variable. But here all we have is z. So we can rewrite one as dp dz equal minus rho g. I'll call that equation two. Really the same as equation one except with total derivatives. So this is our equation of fluid statics or hydrostatics. dp dz is minus rho g. Suppose we have some location z1, where this is the z direction, and some other height z2, we can find pressure difference by integrating. We integrate to get p2 if we know p1, and we know how rho and g vary with z. We separate the variables and write dp is minus rho g dz, which we can integrate from p1 to p2 and from z1 to z2 on the right. This is the general case. If either of these variables, rho or g, is not constant, you have to do an integration. Now, g doesn't vary much with elevation, so we'll always consider g a constant, but rho can vary with elevation. Simplest case is incompressible 
impossible where rho is a constant and g is constant unless delta z is huge. So for the incompressible case, we integrate p2 minus p1 is equal to the rho and the g can both come outside the integral since they're constants. And this integral is just z2 minus z1. So for an incompressible fluid in hydrostatics, we simply have this expression. This holds for any incompressible fluid at rest. Keep in mind if you're doing homework problems, for example, if density is not a constant, you must integrate. We can rewrite this as our simple equation from previously. Namely, without worrying about the negative signs, we just rewrite this as p below equal p above plus rho g delta z. I like this form because you never get confused with negative signs. And it clearly shows that p increases with depth. I'll end by saying this, we can solve any hydrostatics problem with this equation. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.